Yeah. Well, like somebody yeah. understands Lutheran, as I told someone, because we've got coffee and donuts, <laughs> which is uh, <laughs> absolutely uh, <laughs> essential material. <laughs> so, really, really, really happy to be here. Glad to see you all. Um, <laughs> Uh, I had to knock at the door. It was something biblical about standing there and knocking at the door to get into the church. Yeah. Um, which um, I highly approve of because of what it means that's happening that ought to be happening. So that's one of the reasons um, I'm so happy to be, uh, my wife and I are happy to be members of this church is that everything that's going on here on Saturday is the kind of thing that, that ought to be happening. So um, I'm glad we're up here talking about the kinds of uh, important things that, that guide us um, in the sort of um, navigating the mission of the congregation. And before I start on the four texts we're going to look at, I want to talk just about why this, why I think this is important. Okay, you may not. Uh, I'm going to try and convince you. But I want to put this in a in a really global uh, perspective because um, I don't. It, it, well, I I know we're all here because we enjoy learning and uh, maybe hoping hoping to have a little bit of understanding of the New Testament, and that that's great. That would be just fine. I'd be happy with doing that. But I do think something hopefully more important uh, is happening, and it is a, a more global concern. And and the concern is this that that um, as, as we live in the world that, that we've been given to live in, um, we're constantly making value judgments about things, constantly. And it seems as if that decision making has grown even more complicated, um, more hazardous, if I think I can say, um, given the world we're, we're in. Um, for one thing, information overload. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's a huge part of why our decision making is complicated. Lots of claims. And as things are emerging, we're finding out that that, that information overload itself is not pure information, but itself has to be evaluated, not just taken in. You, you understand what I'm saying? Um, and then, Resources. We seem to be constantly struggling with the level of our resources. So we have to make choices about our, our energy, or our time, our attention, all of those kinds of things. And then another aspect of why this is important is that, and here uh, I, I, I kind of almost want to shut off the recording and shut the door. Because what I want to say is that all around us, um, and I'll use the general term, religion is being not only dumbed down, but falsified. Uh, which is to say, religion is being used for a lot of nefarious reasons, and a lot of aspects of religion, I'm speaking generally, I'm not just talking about Christianity, okay, but a lot of religion, it's been put to the service of some kind of ideology. <laughs> and that means that we're having to also make some critical judgments about the religious claims around us. Huh? Um, I, I just I was had coffee with the Herald this morning, and there's an article in there about the fact that the key uh, GOP advocate internally for the Republican National Party and the White House to pay attention to the claims of evangelical Protestantism has resigned saying they're not giving me enough attention. Well, I didn't even know there was such a, a, a person internal making those kinds of advocacies. Huh? And it's just, I mean, that, that's good for them for being, um, okay, um, active and smart enough to get inside and try to influence government, uh, fine. But the point is, there's a lot of that going on. And uh, unfortunately, um, we are learning that, that uh, let's get specific about Christianity. Um, the claims are being made um, that if you put it in the critical context of people who, who know a little bit about church history and have a little more sophisticated understanding of the Bible would say, you know, th those, those claims are 
really, there, there's, that's, that's dumb. <laughs> um, and, and yet, it's believed, and it's used, it's used, huh? So, wh what does that say? Uh, well, I, I used to say to um, students, you know, that in, in a certain way, um, the Bible is an adult book. <laughs> It's, it's not easy, it is somewhat complicated, and to just pick it up and read it and say, well, that must mean that. So your obligation, as those 35 years I spent training clergy, your obligation is in part to be a religious educator. Huh? And that means that you, know, you need to pay some attention to helping your congregants have a little better, deeper understanding of Scripture. And, uh, so that's a little bit of the global thing. Now let me come specific to this topic. Um, all those years I had spent um, visiting congregations and myself a pastor and an interim and all that kind of thing. Um, I've heard both pastors and lay people say things uh, about Jesus that are, I would just describe as spongy. I mean, uh, <laughs> sort of like, uh, well that's what Jesus was all about. Have you ever heard that phrase? And, and I, I'm trying to sort out, well, what part was that? Uh, the, thing, the thing about following Jesus as an example in our decision making and reflection is really important. And it's something that should take place. Um, the problem is that, that there's, there's not a single Jesus. <laughs> um, we're not even talking about the Gospels and other materials about Jesus outside of our New Testament, but inside. We have quite different Jesus. And here's the thing. Remember that, that this, this denomination and, and others use what is called the lectionary. And one of the reasons they do that is because we want to listen to Matthew for a year and then to Luke for a year. Huh? And a whole lot of John mixed in. <laughs> uh, and and um, Mark is is smaller so that we don't get quite enough mark in three years. But, but we get all four. So it, it, it's kind of like we're focusing on what, what, how is Matthew's Jesus leading us this year? Huh? And that's good. That's good. That's exactly the point. Because there are times in our lives when we need a Matthew Jesus. And that, that's where discernment and thought comes in. And there's time when we need a John Jesus. Huh? And so how can you do that? if it's just all mushed up in your head. And I'm afraid it is in, in a lot of cases. So this is not like uh, I'm an intellectual academic so I know things you don't know. This is simply, this is not rocket science. This is just about allowing the Jesus who emerges to have his own portraiture in his own place. And then being, here's the real skill, being able to let Matthew's Jesus talk to John's Jesus on these complicated things. And, and, and that's not as difficult as it might seem. Now, in case you're wondering if this is some kind of new fabulous insight that Dr. Hewitt has achieved, let me tell you that the earliest writing theologian we have outside of the New Testament, Irenaeus, talks about this. He said, well, of course there are four portraits of Jesus. Just as there are four winds, and I mean, that we're talking about a guy born of 125, and he names these four, and he gives them, he gives them figures like this Jesus is uh, uh, the, the the lion, this Jesus is the ox. Uh, he gives he gives them identity. So so he doesn't have a problem with the fact that we got four different Jesus. He see, he sees it as a value. Now from time to time. This has been dumbed down, and people have said, well, yeah, well, we not, let's not confuse people. We really need to get these all together and just have one Jesus. And, that, and it's always been rejected by, by wiser heads. Well, why is, that, why is that not a problem to have um, these four portraits? Wait a minute, what, 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 what Jesus are, are we following? Well, I, I'm going to just use a little bit. Of, of Aristotle here, if I can, if you don't mind. He, he's, he's written the most important um, book we've ever had called Poetica on his understanding of how story works. And um, he talks a lot about what he calls plot. And by the way, um, since that's written in Greek, um, 
the word that we translate as plot in Greek is mythos, myth, huh? But we use myth in a different way. But for him, it means it means what are the bones of the story? That's what he talks about. And he said, well, Aristotle said, we you always have uh, when you're writing a story, you have a beginning. And you have a middle, and you have an end. And then he poses the question, well, what controls the plot? Yeah, well, he said, there's no question about that. It's the end. The end controls the plot. So what you are doing in the beginning is setting up a process of unfolding events, and some would add under causation, and this series of events logically leads to the end. The middle holds apart the beginning and the end. Simple. Isn't that simple? In fact, you may even have heard every story has a beginning, middle, and end. It comes from Aristotle. Now, why is that relevant to the point? Well, the reason it's not a problem to have four different portraitures of Jesus is that all four of the stories containing those four different Jesuses has the same plot, the same end. Total agreement. Even though they look completely different in the middle and the beginning, they all have the same end. And that's where... Irenaeus was when he said this. And what is the end? What is the agreement? What is the plot? What, 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 what is it about? Oh, I'm not going to test you here. It's clear. It's the salvific death of Jesus. So these Gospels are essentially proclamations in narrative form. That's what they are. So the reason that the, the difference between the Gospels and Paul is not significant is because that's exactly the end is all about Paul. <laughs> he doesn't write stories, but he only has one message. <coughs> Christ crucified and raised from the dead, right? So Paul and the four Gospels all have the same book. So that, that was Irenaeus' point. We have total apostolic agreement as to what the meaning of the event of Jesus Christ was. But he appeared differently in these different communities where the story about him evolved. Is that, is that pretty clear? I want to stop and see if you have any questions about that because I want to make sure that we're starting out on common ground. Is that so clear you don't have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> wow. But Paul was sort of a proclaimer, wasn't he really? I mean, he was yeah, exactly. Well, but so are Matthew, Mark, Luke, yeah, and John. They, they, they use narrative. Yeah. And by the way, here's something interesting. Um, a, a, a Charles Foreman, uh, kind of a colleague of mine, uh, Southern Methodist University years ago, uh, did a lot of research and found out there's only eight places in Paul, who has the majority of the New Testament, by the way, where anything like the life of Jesus is mentioned. And some of those are questionable. Paul was not interested in the story of Jesus. He was interested in the plot of the Gospels. Uh, here's a real zinger. I remember that the earliest document we have in the New Testament is First Thessalonians, not the Gospels. And so the question emerges, maybe that plot emerged under the influence of Paul. Aha. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So you see, you see, you see the point here is that, that yes, we are believers in the salvific death of Christ and his resurrection and being good Lutherans, yeah. And the fact that that creates the possibility of our experiencing salvation based on the the grace created by that death and resurrection. Am I, am I right? See? So that that's that's not a question. The question is: in living our daily lives, is the story and the portraiture of Jesus that emerges an important part of our thinking and guiding? Now, if you say no to that, I got a real problem <laughs> because. More and more people are, when they, when they say, let's just be honest, a lot of people say, you know, I, I, could, I could be a Baptist, I could be a Lutheran, I could probably be a Catholic. Um, 
as long as I find the right community and people who are doing the right kind of thing, I might not go along with all the doctrine. But I'm a great admirer of Jesus. In fact, we have a movement um, now, small movement, in which people have said the problem with Christianity is the formal structure and organization of Christianity. The solution for the problem is just become a follower of Jesus without church. Huh? Because churches tend to ruin it. Huh? Yeah, and I think anybody who knows church history has to say, yeah, Jesus has been used for a lot of nefarious things within Christianity, just as Muhammad has been. That's the problem with religion. So, in a way, following Jesus carefully and weighing carefully the different Jesuses we have becomes a corrective of all that has possibly gone awry with Christianity in its affirmation of dogma. That's a little that's a little complicated, but yeah, you with me here? This is pretty important stuff. Pretty important stuff. Can you point uh, can you point to some of where you're going already? Yeah, I can. Uh, when I can. you say sure. that the four faces help us with a sure, corrective. Sure, sure. I, yeah. That really is a wonderful, engaging thought. Right. Okay, let, let me, let me I, I'll, just I'll, point, you don't have to go there, but just point. Oh, I can point, absolutely can point. Uh, if you had absolute full premium cable service and sat there with your remote and, and clicked on every TV evangelist out there, <laughs> you would find out not a one of them wants anything to do with Matthew's Jesus. Beautiful. Now, one of them want anything to do with the fact that, that righteousness, meaning being more righteous than the law demands in the concrete acts of mercy is not an aspect of our following Jesus. Huge, a huge distortion out there in TV land. Yes? I just, I would just like to know, I notice we're we're taking a recording of this. Are we going to be able to get get that recording? Uh, because I don't want to have to take notes. I want to listen. <laughs> I, think, I think it's up to him. Yeah. yeah. Our, our hope is it'll be online. Yeah. Excellent. Let, 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 me, let me give you an example uh, that kind of follows up on that. And, and we're going to get to Matthew. Second, um, I, when I was dean of various seminaries, I, I did a lot of what they call accreditation work, which means you go to schools and review whether or not their accreditation should be standing or not. Okay, I ended up going to several, what, and I really don't like the usurpation of this word, evangelical seminaries. Okay. Some very big, some very, um, very, very well constructed and, and good faculties. And about the third one along, I, I said to the team, I said, I said, wait a minute, where, where, um, let's look at that core curriculum. Where, where, where are the courses in ethics? Well, there aren't any. Well, do you have any professors with, whose portfolio is, is moral and ethical thought? Uh, no. Well, why? Well, because if you're born again, you want to do good. <coughs> What's good? <laughs> That's right. What's good? Th th there's no concern for Matthew's Jesus who says, as you're going to see, uh, our job is to make perfect the law in our doing. I didn't, they want nothing to do with that. Huh? Well, when I was dean of a Catholic seminary, well, the seminaries just say, well, we're not really becoming priests, we're becoming lawyers. <laughs> because about half their curriculum was made up of moral law and how to administer it huh, at a various level. So uh, the point is, that, that, that there you go. I, I pointed and did a little more than point. Okay, now, um, we're going to um, pass these out, and so I can use a little help, um, and then we're going to get started on these four, because I don't want to, I don't want to cheat anybody on terms of this. Um, I got on my official. Yep.
I think we have enough. We have 20 printed. And when you get it, Mark should be on top. And uh, we will we'll definitely take a break, uh, if nothing else, from my voice. But uh, and, and if you see me slipping lozenges in my mouth, is I find as I pass the 80 mark, I'm my mouth gets dry, <laughs> so <laughs> I need to keep liberally, liberally uh, uh, juiced up here with these uh, lozenges. Don't worry about it. I'm fine. Um, Mark, okay. Okay, let me back into this. There, there's a there's an old a British uh, Anglican priest scholar by the name of Sir John Hawkins. Uh, my my picture of him. He lived in a, not in the 20th century, end of the 19th century. Typical cleric, you know, he's, a, he, he's been given a living. He's got a first class degree in what they call greats from Oxford, which means uh, he probably started writing in Greek in the fifth grade. <laughs> and all he has to do is to go out to the, his rose garden in the morning and tell the gardener how to tend his roses. Then he goes in and he's got a big table in his study. He's got all the documents laid out. He spends five, six hours in there looking over the Greek New Testament, making notes. and. Uh, then at five o'clock he goes over to the chapel and says matins with five the same five old ladies and then has a glass of sherry. This is the kind of guy he was. And after years and years of this, he published a paper and he said something very odd happening um, because we know that that Mark supplies material for Matthew and Luke, but when I follow Matthew and Luke editing the stories from Mark, I found 14 places where Jesus appears in a way that is profoundly human, and Matthew and Luke remove all vestiges of that. Well, it was brilliant, it was brilliant. And it, it was actually the beginning of um, more serious um, attention to Mark. Uh, so that's an interesting way of backing into the point that Mark presents the most human Jesus. And so one of the values of Mark is if you want to see Jesus in his vulnerability as a hum real human being, not just a god on an earthly disguise, Mark's your guy. Um, he even at times in Mark, we're not looking at that passage, but as an example, there are times in Mark when he is, seems confused. And he'll turn around and say, well, what just happened? Ooh. And Matthew doesn't like that at all. Because <laughs> in Matthew, uh, Jesus knows what happens before it's said. So this is, this is pretty interesting stuff. Now the passage I chose today is, is one of the passages um, that Sir John Hawkins discovered, but it's also a, a kind of a, a fun conversation starter. So if, have you got Mark? It says Jesus gets mad, you see that? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the texts I'm using today are all different, and uh, what I have done is um, occasionally to do my own translation, sometimes I used the NRSV and took out punctuation, uh, I did all kinds of things just to keep you happy. This is my own fun translation. Now, if you look at where the Greek starts, two-thirds down the page, that's all the Greek is. Now, look at the, the amount of English. Huh? <laughs> oh, okay, so I, you got me, all right? I'm, I'm, I'm not adding anything, but I am emphasizing some aspects of the very artful way that Mark writes um, by just being very liberal with my paraphrastic editions, okay? So let me read this for you. Yet another time, he, that's Jesus, went ahead right into a, quote, place of prayer. And in that place, he found a fellow who had been suffering for a long, long time with a severe physical problem with his hand. It was all dried up into a useless claw. And now, 
as it happened, there were certain people in that place who knew full well how Jesus could not turn a blind eye to people he ran into who were suffering from various maladies. In fact, he always looked upon them and acted out of his compassion for their suffering. So, knowing this, these onlookers in the place of prayer were sneakily watching just to see if perchance Jesus would do something they could get on him and put him in harm's way as a result. So, sure enough, Jesus walks up to the man with the dried up useless hand and says to him, come over here, stand right here in the middle of all these folks. Next thing, he turns to the onlookers, the ones looking to find something they could use against Jesus, who were standing all around him, and the suffering man, right there in a cluster with Jesus and the poor man, and then he says to those onlookers, I'll leave it up to you to decide, you all to decide. Here is the question. What is the best thing to do during the holy day of total rest? Would it be to do the right thing, or would it be to not do the right thing? In other words, should you decide to act contrary to the normal customs of the nun activity on the holy day of total rest, and in doing so, save someone's life? Or would it be better to strictly observe the customs of the holy day of total rest with the result of actively contributing to the death of the person? And there is no response. Every single person standing around Jesus and the suffering man just stood their mouths shut tight like clams. <laughs> Next thing, Jesus begins fixing his gaze on all those standing around in a circle, and as he turned and read their faces, he became more and more angry until his guts were writhing with rage. You see, he was cut to the quick with what he saw. Total silence. A silence that revealed cold hearts made of stone. And so he says to the poor suffering man, go ahead, just stick out your hand. And the person did so, and his dried up, withered hand was restored to full use. The very next thing, the religious Hephes, who had been observing all this, went straight out of the place of prayer, and quick as you please, found local political hacks related to the hated puppet government and arranged a secret meeting behind closed doors. And they put together a conspiracy made up of a collaboration of religious and political forces, and the conspiracy was to arrange to have Jesus not only silenced, but killed. Well, I've, I've enhanced this, but uh, I want to start with the, the most significant aspect of um, this Greek text. Now, if you look um, at, uh, look at the Greek text, and count down uh, one, two, three, four, five, and there's a little number five in the left hand. You see that? Mm -hmm. Now count in one, two, three, four, five words, and it's in bold print, and it looks like an O and a P. You see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that word that I, here's how I've translated that word in order to, to, to make it. He became more and more angry until his guts writh were writhing with rage. That all translates that word. Now that word is pronounced in, in Greek, orgais. Now, it, this is the only place in all of literature where Jesus is experienced uh, as having orgais. Now, that's the word that gives us the English word orgasm. Now, the, reason, the reason Matthew and Luke don't like this is because, uh, let, let, by the way, yeah, I have an unabridged um, a Greek lexicon that's like that. Okay. So I know exactly how this word is used in the whole of Greek of literature. Okay. Now, this is, not, this is not mental anger. This is a visceral, unchecked, spontaneous rage from the belly. This is fire in the belly. He can't control it. That's why Luke and Matthew don't like it. He's in control of his emotions. There's nothing rational about it. He's in control of his emotions. He's not, he's not in control of his emotions. 
So there you have a really human Jesus. Now, here's what's interesting. Follow it. The fact that he cannot control this emotion of rage at what he's experiencing, Mark claims, got him killed. Got him killed. Now, I want to point out to you that in the history of those who have tried to recreate the example of Jesus in their lives, there are without count people whose rage at injustice have gotten them killed. Hundreds, thousands. You see? Were they did they have did they have any sense of religious authorization to do that? Yes. So if you want a Jesus who agrees that sometimes the coldness of injustice you're experiencing puts a fire in your belly that makes it dangerous to you, you're good. You're good. And in fact, if it's not happening somewhere, it's bad. So I've heard a lot of half-baked sermons in my life, frankly. None of them in Lutheran churches. <laughs> um, where, where you get kind of like... Um, some pop psychology about, um, you know, anger will eat you up, and anger is a bad thing. And it, 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 you follow me here? See, they they, they haven't read Mark. Huh? This, this kind of anger can be a good thing. Huh? Yes. We've got another instance of anger when he cleanses the temple. Yeah, but there's no internal description of what's happening inside of him. You're right. And it's in John, oddly enough, because in John, this is why we need all the Gospels, he actually braids a whip. Right. And it's then I point, yeah, in fact, if you're looking, what you're doing is important. You're looking across the whole of our scripture. All right? So that's number one. You know what number three is? Book of Revelation. He comes at the end with what? Not a whip, but a sword. You, you haven't read Revelation for a while, probably. Huh? Called call the sword of his mouth to destroy. So here you have John with a whip, Mark with this orgasm of anger, and in Revelation, the final judgment with a sword. So is Jesus always gentle shepherd? <laughs> So, sh uh, let me just put this to you. Is it credible that there would be individuals or groups or movements or, or congregations of people who decide that their survival is less important than dealing with the injustice around them? You better hope there are, and there have been. So that's why you need Mark. And if there's no place for a Jesus who is so viscerally motivated to act against his own best interest, then, you know, you're only paying attention to part of the New Testament. Yes? It, it sounds here that Jesus is functioning uh, like an Old Testament prophet. Yeah, exactly. They were, they were deeply moved yeah. by many of the things yeah. that they said. Yeah. Some, something happens. What, what's going on? Let me get a little technical in terms of literary criticism. Mark is the is is the, the only writer uh, in these four who utilizes what we call a an a, a, a omniscient narrator, someone who goes inside of Jesus and describes what he's experiencing. Mm -hmm. That's not done in in Matthew and, and, and Luke, and and certainly not John. Or the observer type of style. Right? The the observer, yeah, the. But, but we believe this is how. How do we know Jesus experiences this orgasm? Huh? Well, if you had been there, uh, then maybe you saw his face get red or something. But the point is, the the narrator goes inside. Now, why? What? Wh what happens with this? Why is this important? Well, I'll tell you why. This Mark is is a psychological writer. He's the only one that is. Because um, what he what happens is. When, when a, an omniscient narrator draws you inside and describes what's happening inside of people, which happens all the time in modern novels, right? You are 
your credibility is enhanced. You believe that more than an external what? Because you're being drawn into the secret parts of the human being. It's, it's very tricky. In fact, I have a colleague, another colleague, Dennis McDonald at Claremont, spent most of his career trying to prove that actually Mark is modeled on Homeric uh, epics. That, that Mark is Homeric. And, and he's the only one who actually writes script that can be acted out without change. In fact, there have been two or three people who have made a career out of simply reciting Mark as a theater piece. Uh, I mean, I tried it with others, with my students. You can't do it with anything else in the New Testament, only Mark. Why? Because he'll go into great detail and tell you just exactly what how somebody's feeling or thinking and that kind of thing. So, so it, it's, it's a remarkably uh, artfully written uh, gospel. And, and much of it is around getting inside inside of Jesus. Well, there's some other things going on here. Um, look, let's look at the bullet points. Uh, I already covered bullet point number one. Here's a question for you. It was not okay with Matthew and Luke to have Jesus not in control of his guts. Is it okay with you or not? I'll leave that for uh, you to ponder. Uh, or let's not even make it that personal. Let's say, would you not approve of that? Uh, in a fellow believer. Is that also why we get so much in the Old Testament of what people call the wrathful God? Well, it, this is certainly a description of wrath. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I've heard people say that it's not the same God in the Old Testament and New Testament. Well, that's, <laughs> that, that, of course, is, that. That, that's of course completely mistaken uh, because God in the Old Testament often appears pretty much like we do. I mean, he's, he's, he's so involved with humankind that he's a believable actor on the human stage. And there, there you go, or he or she. Now, now let, let's go back. You're right. I mean, in terms, if you want to see a wrath, the, the, the Jesus coming with the sword of a mouth to destroy is exactly an Old Testament judgmental figure. So th that would be your better basis for saying that. Now, the third bullet point. Uh, really good writers never fill in all the gaps. So here's a gap. This writer tells you very carefully that you know you're brought into the secrets of what's going on. He takes you inside the hearts and minds of the synagogue sitters, right? Telling you their plot. They don't speak it. He, the narrator's telling you. Huh? Now, what the, what the narrator does not tell you, and he could have, is does Jesus recognize it to be a plot? Absolutely. Well, you, you said, okay, why? Well, uh, my Jesus is a rebel. He breaks China. He's there to disturb things. Yeah, but, but the point, what you're saying is if, if, he, if he actually is aware then he's aware that what might happen in here would mean his destruction. Sure, and that's probably he's yeah. showing in yeah. human reaction to that. Yeah. Does anybody see a value on your side of him not knowing? Oh, uh, then uh, yes. Verse 5 says, And Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. So, so he he's, he's, he's in their hearts. There that but but earlier on, since we know that it's a plot forming, do you think Jesus recognizes it as a plot when he walks in? If it's a human Jesus, and Jesus is working it out as he goes along, a value in his not knowing is that he continues to work out the mission as he goes along. Thank you. That I was looking for somebody to articulate that as well. So there you yeah. see. That now this. This is this, by the way, this is how you make the story your own. You, you, you decide that, and then it becomes the story internal to you. And we see that so clearly yeah. in the story about yeah. the, the woman who touches the hem of, well. Ab absolutely, it's a very good example. He doesn't know what's going on. He says, uh, I felt power go out of me. What happened? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so yes, you can read it. You can, you can fill that gap either way. 
And you need to because then it becomes your story. And it, and it, and it becomes more challenging. Yes, more challenging. Yes, exactly. Because it challenges me to ask where I am in that story. Exactly. As everything I have to do be rational and calculated, or sometimes are we simply following the example of Jesus? Can I phone it in, or do I actually have yeah. to work it out? Yeah. What, what did Paul say? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Or what, or what if um, I go to a meeting and I'm seeing uh, dishonesty, I'm seeing lack of integrity, I'm seeing coldness of heart. Uh, uh, I, I know I've got congregants in there, I'm a minister. Do I stand up and say, wait a minute, this is all bullshit. <laughs> and I know that that might mean term, that at the way. next council meeting, I'm up for review, okay? Um, so th th that's what you're saying. Or you might stand up in Congress and make a statement this week. Exactly. <laughs> now, Mark, Mark does some tricky things, and, and here's where um, he is such an artful writer. He's not a smooth writer, he's an artful writer. Luke is a smooth writer, but, but he's so artful. And let me take, I'll give you a couple ideas. Um, interestingly enough, there's a particular verb uh, in Greek, it's a tekel, and it means to seek. Huh? And in Mark, something odd is taking place. Everybody who's seeking Jesus is wrong. It, it, it seems ironic, right? And it's because they're trying to control him. So Mark uses the word seek as a bad thing. It's always bad. Huh? So, you know, there's this famous scene. Uh, here's another humanist. This was this is a howler. Chapter 3. Um, where um, Jesus is going about all this charismatic work he's doing. And the text cannot be translated any other way than saying, and, and his family came and tried to take him away because they thought he was going crazy. And the word is outside of himself in Greek. He's not, he's not himself, huh? They thought, we, we got to protect him. Let's, let's take him away. <coughs> huh? um, of course, nobody else in the New Testament wants that in there. <laughs> okay. Especially Luke, who, who thinks Mary is just wonderful. Huh? But uh, later on, the family then comes and stands, well, he's teaching. And it's really, it's really cute because he, he's teaching in the middle, and around him are followers. And then outside is the family. And Luke says, and they came seeking him. Or somebody inside says, your family's seeking you, which is bad. And he looks around and says, that's not my family. This is my family. <laughs> really interesting. Now, that, that, that story uses a, a very particular loaded verb that Mark always uses the same way, periblepo, looking around at those at his feet. He says, so whenever, whenever Mark's Jesus engages in periblepo, looking around, he's judging. So did you notice how I overwrote this? He puts the man in the middle. And then surrounding him are his, are his conspirators. Huh? And then it describes, and looking around, he, was, he experienced or gaze at the coldness of their heart. Huh? So that, 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 that's another tricky way that he, he writes. So if you know Mark, when he looks around, look out. This is judgment coming. Okay. And so there's, there's vast judgment going. I've overwritten the, uh, the conspiracy thing. They put together a conspiracy made up of a collaboration. Well, the word here, I, I think I'll actually point this out to you because it's kind of interesting. If you look at the very bottom line of the Greek and count over, one, two, three, four, five, six, that word that looks like a, 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 a O with a, ta with a tail on the top and then a U, Okay, that that is a technical word. Often it appears often. It's a, it's the word used um, in conspiracies against philosophers, and it, the, the the S that's really an S U on the front. Okay, and that S U M that that is the word 
It translates in a Latin word co. So it's co conspirators. Huh? Now, you notice what this means. This means this is yet another aspect of Mark. He's saying that, that the force of evil is the result of a collaboration between religion and government. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now, this is why people think that Mark's gospel may have been written partly as a protest uh, of, of, of the cruel political structure of the Mediterranean world. Huh? This and the demoniac story of it. I won't go into that, but the, the, the point is that this is a, this is a, these are co-conspirators. The sum total of this, now my, mind you, Mark is writing after there is a church, okay? There's a church. He, he's writing in, in a way that suggests that religion, even Judeo-Christian religion, has the potential of being a co-conspirator with government for evil. Now that's powerful stuff. Let's go on down. Um, the one, two, three, four, fifth bullet point. Observe the excellent storytelling style, especially the historical present and iterative verbs. Now let me explain that. You know, uh, when you tell a really good joke, it always goes this way. Remember this? Uh, so there's this priest, a rabbi, and a Baptist preacher, and they go into a bar, and uh, the bartender says to them, says, that's the way Mark writes. It happens about 50 times in Mark. It's also maybe an example of the study of storytelling. So in five times, I think it is, uh, the writer says, so Jesus says to them. <coughs> what that does is, that's called a historical present, it's, the story is cast in the past, but it brings us to, to the present. Now, iterative imperfects. Well, you can't do this uh, in, in English, but you can do it in Spanish. Because there we have uh, preteritum and co-preteritum and imperfect. It's, it's a little better language for storytelling. What it means is that when the verb says, uh, and, he, uh, and he hurt, uh, it, it means that he kept on being hurt again and again and again. So this story is filled with iterative imperfects. Again and again and again. What it does is it enhances the seriousness of the man's condition. And that's really the next bullet point. Um, I think I already covered the rest of these uh, pretty well. Um, but now I want to uh, point out something uh, again that's artful. Okay, uh, it's, um, let's see here. Um, well, it's about the silence, okay. And I, I want—I I don't know how much detail to show you in a Greek text, but okay, I, I'll do it because it's really, it's really important. Uh, in the Greek text, count down lines one, two, three, four, and go to the very end of line four, and there's a word there that looks like an E, and then another O with an I on, with a tail on it, and an I. You see that? It's mm -hmm. it, it's it's the opo. Now, that word uh, is, occurs many times, but it also occurs in a juridical uh, setting. It's the word used of the silence, uh, in fact, of Plato at the trial in which he's condemned to death. And so what's happening here is the word for silent, remain silent. And it's, it's uh, by the way, only used here um, in the New Testament. And the silence here uh, is the silence of the conspirators, the co-conspirators. And the reason that they are silent is because, as in the case of Plato, they are complicit uh, in, in fact, uh, what setting up, setting up. So now here's another gap. I could, I, if I had time, I would give you each a, a clean sheet of paper and ask you to write 500 words on what's going on in their minds during their silence. That's a huge gap. You know what's going on in their minds, but the story isn't complete until you fill in that gap. Let's get some examples, just quick. Okay, what, what do you think they're thinking? Because the narrator could have them speaking, but they don't. And by the way, 
do they ever speak? No. <laughs> no. What would be going on in their minds? Yeah. Well, because this is a culture of shame and honor, he's just shamed them because they haven't been able to answer his question. And they're supposed to be the religious leaders who know stuff. So, so they're, they're experiencing shame. We also know that they entered the whole scene uh, with a plot in mind. So they're experiencing, would you say, mixed emotions, shame, and do you think their shame is motivating them to go and out and plot his death, or the reverse? Well, I think, I, 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 I would say that they came with a plot in mind. Um, but as often happens in Jesus dialoguing with religious leaders, he turns the table on them and gets the best of them. So shame. Okay, so then there, he put there, some guilt on them. Well, they know the right answer. Sure. <coughs> yeah. But he's put some guilt on them, I think. They realize there's a consequence to what you're doing. So, th but does the, does the guilt uh, Frustration. restrain them from their plot or encourage their it's plot? It's just a mix of emotions. It, it is mixed with emotions. Frustration. Aha, uh -huh. got it. Uh -huh. Okay. You see the point here? You see how artful this is? The story could be rewritten in three acts, yeah. page after page. This is good writing. This is really, really good writing. And it, it's writing that's in the aid of presenting a Jesus. Now remember this. Why is this? Why is this not just didactic preaching? Why is it narrative? It, it's because by the time things have gotten very critical when this when this gospel is written, enormously critical. Remember, Rome's destroyed in seventy two, right? I mean, uh, th th there's re there's rebellion, there's revolt, there's there there's assassination going on. Huh? The reason it's in narrative form is because it's intended to give guidance. It's intended to give guidance. And because it's scripture, that's what's intended for us. Huh? So, are there situations where Christians find themselves in a position exactly like the one Jesus is in? You bet, you bet your boots there are. And sometimes we huh, might, be, might be there. I experience it. Um, I don't know how personal I get here, but... Um, Last 10 years, I've, I've been a court appointed special advocate for Jewish children. Now, there are weeks, and I spend 25, 30 hours. Um, I'm in a lot of two day trials. I am out doing field investigation with my bench warrant. Um, let me tell you, when I see what happens to children in the system, not only just what parents do to them, but what the system does to them. Huh? Mm -hmm. I mean, incompetence, big holes in the net. Uh, you know, Bureaucratic nonsense, uh, lack of funding, lack of political will to do for them what needs to be done. I mean, I mean, sometimes the fire in my belly is I'm afraid to stand up and testify in court. I'm afraid. I'm so angry. I woke up three, four o'clock this morning, going through how I'm going to do conduct an examination of a witness in a case coming up next week, and uh, my my guts were just rolling. How can I? How can I nail this? We need to get viscerally angry at times. Now, here's the point. I preached on this this past summer and while I was doing interim work. I want to observe something. Jesus is not angry of what... It, let's assume he knows what's going on. He's not angry at what they're doing to him. Now, that's a guiding point for us. Our anger is authorized by Jesus one that's because of the justice done to others, not to us. That's, that's a really important nuance. Now, get out Matthew. Now, I can make this a little bit shorter because I preached on this, actually, and decided not to change it because I wanted to go in a little more depth than I could when I was preaching. Um, but we will read this right. This is... This is the NRSV, but I'll tell you, you'll notice I've taken out uh, versification. And I would like to say a word about that. Um, it, was a, it was a brilliant discovery. And it, it, it sounds strange. When, when the editorial 
uh, point was, was observed by John Locke, to the, the philosopher. He said, look, look, at, look at our authorized version of the Bible. Every verse starts with a new paragraph. That destroys the continuity of the narrative. And it means that a reasonably intelligent layperson who's not trained can't make sense out of the story because it's all broken up. It was a brilliant discovery until finally, when we started, when J.B. Phillips was the first one, took all verses out of the body so that the flow of the story could be seen. It, it didn't sound like much, but it, it is, these are stories. These are not points in a theological treatise. So that's why I took out all the versification and uh, make the story <coughs> flow a little better. Otherwise, this is just a straight NRSV. Oh, once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. And again, he sent other slaves, saying, tell those who have been invited, look, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready, come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it, and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. <coughs> the king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those, slave, those murderers, and burnt their city. And then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets, gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. And then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Now, I have to tell a little anecdote. In, in Denver, uh, where I was a, a dean of a Catholic seminary, for some reason I was following around uh, in, a, in Methodist churches what, what's called a district superintendent. And evidently this fellow had a canned sermon so when he went to these congregations, he always preached the same sermon. Because the Methodist church is not a liturgical church, so you don't have to use a lectionary. So by accident, I listened to him preach twice in a period of about three months. He always used this text. But when he read it from the pulpit and before he began his sermon, he refused to read the last part. Oh. And I'm sitting there, New Testament professor, writhing in my pew. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> if he doesn't like Matthew's version, why didn't he use the other gospel? I mean, what, 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 what's going on? He didn't like the way it ended. <laughs> now, this is classic Matthew from lots of viewpoints. Uh, this is what we call a, a, um, a lockstep Matthew a parable, in which, there, frankly, there isn't a lot of mystery, but there, is, there are what we call tropes uh, in, in uh, literary criticism. In other words, themes. Huh? And, he, and, and Matthew, Matthew will do this. Now, I mentioned in my sermon uh, that the kind of the, uh, almost the, the, the model for this one is in Matthew's famous uh, um, parable chapter 13, where he ends with um, the, his own parable, not anywhere else, of the dragnet, where <clears throat> the, the fishermen bring in the dragon is full of fish, and they stand on the shore, and they sort out the bad from the good. And uh, only in Matthew, uh, Jesus turns to the disciples and says, now, do you understand this? Well, in a few times in all of the Greek New Testament, the Greek word for yes is used. 
And they say, and I know it sounds like no, but they say, Nai? Yeah, we get it. We get it. Which could not possibly be true in Mark. Okay. Because in Matthew, the disciples do get it. And disciples are given incredible authority, especially Peter. You're the rock. I'm going to build the church on, on, the, on you. Not your testimony, on you. And what you say goes, what you say doesn't go, doesn't go. So, in any case, what's going on here is that by the time Matthew gets to this chapter 22, if you know Matthew, there is no mystery to this ending. None whatsoever. Because it's like grain growing with weeds, another Matthew parable. It's like fish, huh? And then the one coming up, it's like the oil in the lamps. Huh? And so look at the detail of good and bad. Now those words, uh, in fact, let's just look at the bullet, at the uh, uh, the numbers here. And by the way, the numbers are the n <clears throat> kind of pointing out. If you look at, at, at point number one, uh, I, I point good good storytelling often has three points. That's why there's always uh, a Catholic a Catholic priest uh, or a <laughs> rabbi. In the it's it's uh, always a good. so. <clears throat> there's there's three movements, and that's that's just a re that's good solid storytelling. But if Mark were writing this, it would, be, it would be two times as long. Notice there are no what we call um, interesting fictive details. Uh, it, it, it's, just, it's written very in a very straightforward uh, way that it makes it clear what's happening without a lot of fall to law. Uh, and that, that's, that's classic Matthew. He will, he will always reduce Mark's stories by a certain amount, sometimes half, uh, when he's using Mark. And, and so this is, this is a, a very, very Matthean way to approach storytelling uh, by Jesus. But he is careful to include themes or tropes that are really important. You notice, for instance, uh, the phrase, those slaves went out into the street and gathered. Same word used in the wheat and wheats. At the end, the, 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 the harvesters, the angelic harvesters, will be sent to gather both the weeds and the wheat and be separated, and the weeds will be burned and the wheat kept. Same. So this, this, this tells you Matthew's working here on a program. Huh? Now, the part that the, that the Methodist DS didn't like about the wedding robe it's evidently well. Let's look. Let's look at the um, uh, fourth point. The invited guests are not worthy. The, the key word here is the third one, axio. Something that is key for Matthew. The disciples are to conduct their mission only when the harvester, when the hearers are worthy. Matthew ten thirteen. And Matthew ten thirty seven thirty eight is especially cogent. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. That, that. So there's the, there's the second key Matthean trope. Huh? That, that people are being measured. Now, Mark is not interested in measuring at all. And actually, Luke is not either. Matthew is very interesting in evaluating measuring, gathering, and sorting. Why? Well, because Matthew is the gospel of the church. And by the time Matthew is writing, we're talking about 20, 25 years, a whole generation later than Mark, a lot of sorting and gathering has taken place. Am I guessing? No. And I'll tell you why. Chapter 18 of Matthew. The only the second place in all of the four Gospels where the word church is actually mentioned, where it talks about conflict in the church. You sort, you sort, you gather. Somebody scandalizes. Go to them. Try to sort it out. If that doesn't work, take two or three people. Try to sort it out. If that doesn't work, go before the whole church and sort it out. Now, do you remember how that ends, by the way? If, they, if you can't, if you can't, Yep, out. Out. <coughs> so sorting, gathering, 
judging is an aspect of the gospel. So, um, it is true by the time, you remember how Matthew ends, by the way? Now, finally, go out unto all the nations. Huh? Gather everybody. See, that's it. Teaching, baptizing. In other words, yeah, but our job is just bring everybody in. Doesn't matter if you are a good person or bad. Doesn't matter. Just bring them all in, baptize them. Huh? But once you're in, <laughs> once you're in, there's a famous uh, discovery that all religion is about what does it take to get in and how do you stay in? <laughs> all religions, huh? It's staying in is the issue. So evidently the trope here is consistent with the other tropes in Matthew. What, what you have to do to stay in, you've got to be weaving your wedding garment. Put together your wedding garment. Get it ready. Wear your wedding garment. Yeah. Uh, having spent some time in the uh, Far East, there are restaurants, particularly Japanese restaurants, where you are expected to put on an outer garment over your own garment. Yes. They're provided by the host. Yes. Isn't that another way you could take this? You could take it this way. Garment is provided. By the host, by it, God. It, it would be and a nice nuance. I like it. I like it. But but the point would be, uh, if you want to do it that way, then you're filling in as a sort by saying he's offered a wedding garment, and he said, "I don't need that." Yeah. Okay. There you go. Uh, but the, the outcome is the same. The point is, he didn't have it on. Right. Uh, to and, have gotten him off the street and expect him to have a wedding garment yeah. doesn't make sense. Yeah. But if the host is providing, yeah. it, there's grace again. Yeah, when I, when, I was, when I was a seminary student, there was a guy who used to take us out to dinner. Um, and we went, he took us to a very nice place. And at the door, they had a rack of oh. blazers and ties. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they would put a tie on me and a blazer before they'd sit me down. So, I mean, this is, you know, your point's good. Now, though, this is not mysterious. I don't know why this Methodist guy couldn't figure this out. Uh, <laughs> but, but a wedding garment, it, all you have to do is, what is the first thing Jesus does in public? Huh? <laughs> Sermon on the Mount. Don't think I've come to destroy the law and the prophets. Yeah, I'm not come to destroy them. I've come to end, fulfill them. And unless we actually improve on the righteousness of the Pharisees or perfect it, we are not doing what we should do. That, that's why the that's why the evangelical seminaries don't want ethics professors because they believe in this thing that well if if you're if you're born again you'll always want to do good because your heart's been changed and the heart is the seat of decision making right mm -hmm. just ask all the TV evangelists who've been sued for yeah. um, <laughs> now what's my point uh, you, you always have to have Matthew. Uh, Matthew has a hard time finding uh, a couple audience in a real, a really deep-seated Lutheran congregation because of the principle that salvation is by faith through grace. Um, but Luther understood this, um, actually. And if you go a little deep, deeper in Luther, uh, it's not a conflict. But I would say this, that um, Matthew is the gospel where we find the fact that weaving a garment made up of righteous acts is the life that Jesus portrays in the church, not as a basis for being gathered in. You, you see the sequence here? Yeah, you're in. You're, 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 you're in. Doesn't matter if you're bad. When you're in, put on the wedding garment, and the wedding garment is woven from what our Jewish brethren call mitzvahs, uh, acts of kindness, acts of righteousness, doing what needs to be done. So, um, if a congregation were looking for, let's say, a warrant in the life of Jesus and his teaching for what is taking place on this church campus today, outside of this class, this is, it's Matthew. It's Matthew. 
And if we ever find Matthew being neglected or talked down or interpreted in a way that, well, righteousness really means righteousness of the heart, huh? then we know that Matthew's Jesus is being distorted. Being distorted. And I would say that probably, if I were looking at making a general comment about American Protestantism, I would say this is its chief failure. Is, and why is it a failure? It's because of anti-Catholic bias, historically. That's why. Because um, my, I, was, I was dean of a Catholic seminary in the good old days. Pope John the Twenty Third, and that's why all of us teach you about moral law. I mean, because a priest's job is to say um, uh, your sa your sanctification consists of obeying the moral mandates of the gospel. That's a part of it. That's a part of your salvation. So, uh, what are you doing? How are you living your life? Um, uh, because of our emphasis on the fact, well, you're saved by faith, not by works. You hear that one? Uh -huh. That's, that means that Matthew is not allowed at times to be our primary guide in reflecting on the decision making we're facing. Does that make sense to you? And it's been the thing I have had, in fact, I have probably taught more dedicated courses on Matthew than any other part of the New Testament sure. in my 30 years of teaching in seminars. And I did it because I think this is, uh, has been a pretty consistent failure of American Protestantism. And what I would call its, its, its nasty steroid version <coughs> uh, would be uh, things like the TV evangelist Gospel of Wealth. Uh, oh, yeah. that, 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 that's its steroid nasty version of a, a little bit of a cramp in the mind of American Protestantism. But go all the way back to Luther, because he took such focus on grace. Yeah. yeah and it, of course, it, he was anti-Catholic yeah. because of his frustration. Yeah, yeah, there, there's, 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 there, we, well, I'm afraid we're going to have to be historically critical. Because that's, remember I started out by saying, we're in a time when we are going to have to do critical thinking because there's a lot coming at us. Um, and if we really want to be integritous with our faith, it's going to require that kind of critical thing. And one is, yeah, maybe this thing about we're not saved through works but grace. We, the second sentence is missing. The second sentence is missing. And, and that second sentence has to do with the fact, yes, and we are also called to a wife, to a life of righteousness, having been invited into the wedding feast on the basis of our unworthiness. That's why this is such an important parable. Now, uh, again, Matthew is, you see, the reason Matthew has often become the first gospel translated in hierarchical church mission is because Matthew nails things down simply. Huh? And yet with a certain degree of beauty and artistry, a certain degree. So, so what, how does he do this? Okay, we have this triad of parables in chapter uh, uh, 24, 25. And, and, and the one that is, is, is really significant here is the one about the uh, attendants, the ten attendants who have lamps. And the reason he, it's where it is is because he's talking about Sleeping, which is a metaphor for, um, well, here it is in 90, and we're in the third or fourth generation after Jesus, and she still hasn't returned, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't stay awake. So there's a little bit of that going on in Matthew. Because if, if a generation is 20, and Matthew is about 90, Jesus dies in 30, you, you do the math, huh? So we're, we're about in the third generation already. Well, I wonder when Jesus, is Jesus really going to return? Well, there's a whole series at the end of Matthew saying, yeah, he is, but not in the meantime, don't go to sleep. So there's sleep involved in the, in the parable of the, the maidens because the bridegroom is delayed. Huh? 
which means there, the sleep has meant that they did not anticipate a long-term need for light and oil. <laughs> you get it? So that's like the wedding garment. You've got to have, you gotta not just to have the lamp, which represents the light of the gospel, you've got to have oil in it. What's the oil? <laughs> it's preparedness. It's carrying out the mandate. It's doing the mission. Right? Again, just so this doesn't get to be too artsy, crassy, poetic, he nails it down at the end, the very last one. Sheep and goats. Okay, let's make this simple. You want to know what it is that you're following me? Feed the hungry. Give thirst to those who are thirsty. Give water to those who are thirsty. Visit the prisoner. Visit the sick. Welcome the stranger. Okay, is that simple enough for you? Mm -hmm. That's how you get the winning from me. That's how, that, that's how you wear it. Huh? Doing that. <coughs> and what are we doing here in this campus today? Helping the poor. Helping the poor. I, there's, a, there's a vacant lot over here up for sale. Um, I didn't see any TV evangelists out there giving out food and clothes. Yeah. They will promise you wealth if you send them hundred dollars. I'm being hard on them, and I mean to be. Um, uh, the point is that if you start to neglect Matthew, then um, you are very much in danger of building a shrine to whatever it is you hold as dear that you created in your own ideology. That's what happens. You crawl into this very comfortable <laughs> cathedral, um, and you're there enjoying the fact that you are saved and you're going to heaven and going to have a, a golden harp. And everybody around you are, is someone that, if you don't like them, at least you love them. And everything is just hunky dory. And if the world would just go away, we'd be fine. So here's the final thing. Here, what Matthew, every, these gospels often, often portray Jesus as going, as sending his disciples out on a mission. In t chapter 10 of Matthew, this is done, but some, there's a big Matthean change. What he does is he goes to the part of the gospel which traditionally is about the end of time, judgment, uh, apocalypse. He takes that material and weaves it into the mission statement it, with language, with imagery, etc. Okay, he rewrites the mission that he that he inherited from others, as if it were here. I'll use a big word: the eschatological reality. The, so, in other words, he's saying, "Don't worry about the end times. Make what you do, what you would do in the end times, or how you will be judged in the end times, a part of what you do now." So, whether you are doing the mission or not is your judgment. You see how he does that? It's, it's remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. It means that, you're, that the master of the feast, the king, is walking through the, the wedding hall every day and watching whether or not you've got on the garment. Every day. Not just at the end, but every day. So let me tell you that, well, let me ask you a question. This is kind of a no-brainer, uh, and I'm being a little mischievous, okay. Why is it that the lowest incident of church membership in the United States is number one in Oregon and number two in Washington State? In other words, make it simple. Why do the majority of all of our fellow citizens decide not to have a place in their life for any organized religion? Why? Why, 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 does, why doesn't everybody want to go to church? Well, boy, this is, it is trick. Because <laughs> I, I'm speculating, of course, but and I mentioned this, I think, in Wednesday, too, about 
about suffering. No, nobody wants to be called to judgment, but everybody wants to go to heaven. That that's what our culture is telling. Good. Us, yeah. Right? So sure. that's what we do, right? We yeah. we we're being challenged. Yes. That, and we don't like that. Sure. That 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 part. What any other parts? Um. I don't think, uh, I don't know much about the American culture, but um, as a Christian, I think the one thing that would have made me not want to be a Christian was that I sometimes found Christians to be dull, like people out there were more uh, warm. Lack of life. Yeah, yeah, yeah lack, lack of life. life and yeah. Christians were okay. yeah. more yeah. so. How about credibility? Is credibility, do people have a, yeah. a, a lot of respect for religion? Hypocritical. Yeah, oh, I know. the church is full of hypocrites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or let me let me put it this way. Um, here I'll be a little mischievous. I used to tell my students. I said I was always trying to find a way to get them to think. Like I, I'm known to be mischievous. Okay, so I said, okay, okay, you 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 send somebody to my house five days in a row, wake me up out of a deep sleep at two o'clock in the morning shake me awake and say, quick, don't think about it. Is religion good for the world or bad? <laughs> so I probably would say three mornings out of five is bad. Yeah. What? Yeah. Religion has often proved itself to be bad for the world. Right? You want some examples? Oh, uh, where? I, I don't know. I that's painting a pretty broad brush. Well, it is a broad brush. And, and uh, That's right. you know, if we take any organization, you know, has science been good for the Exactly. Or That's or right. Or and why, why would they, why, why, why could you compare those two? Because they both have, I'll use a phrase that I've heard recently and it fits, non-overlapping magisteria. The scientist, science has a methodology and a way to go through that. And what they've done is point to religion and say, see, but, but, we can't prove this with evidence. Well, let me, but let me stay with you. Has science often proved itself to be not a benefit to the world? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It has. has religion? Yeah. Yes, it has. That's the point. Right. So the, the, here's, here's the thing. Now, what's the antidote for that? Is there an antidote for what? I once owned a book, the title was How to Be a Christian Without Being Religious. Yeah, there you go. And there's a lot of that going around. Yeah. <laughs> um, there is a lot of that. Let me tell you a little secret about myself. For 17 years, I was a part of the Jesus Seminar, which made Time Magazine and so forth. It's a search for the core of the historical Jesus, which uh, when I was dean of another seminary, one of the board Letters were written to the president asking that I be fired, and they were burning my books, okay? Because um, we were challenging a lot of traditional understandings, okay? At those meetings we had, when we were going over these texts, we would often meet in, in, a, in a, a banquet hall, or a, 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 a big hall, or even a gymnasium, and there were bleachers all around the Scholar Center. And the bleachers were full of people who traveled from all over the United States and Canada, and sometimes abroad, who had given up on the Christian religion but were seeking to follow Jesus. Very interesting. So, what's the antidote for bad religion? Matthean Christianity. Because if you are feeding the poor, visiting the sick, standing up for the unjust treatment of prisoners, welcoming strangers, does that give you moral credibility? Street cred. Yeah, <laughs> street cred, exactly. That's another reason you need Matthew. And if you're, I think I mentioned it in the sermon. No, I didn't, no, this is another sermon I gave somewhere else. Uh, in Ohio, where I was functioning for a long time, they did a, a big religious survey, and they were trying to determine the uh, the credibility and trust of religious identification in the state of Ohio. And when the results came in, the two most highly respected representatives of religion 
One was number one was the Salvation Army. Mm -hmm. Number two were Mennonites. Mm -hmm. Ohio is full of Mennonites. So what happens yeah. if there's a tornado or something? Mennonites load up lumber and workmen, and they go and they fix things. Mm -hmm. So does that give you? A, I mean, everybody say, "Oh, well, I thought my religion would do better." Well, uh, if you were more Mathian, you would do better. So we need Matthew. Abs and we need the Jesus of Matthew. And here, let me go back to the beginning and we're going to take a break. We, 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 the discernment, and I don't mean individual, I mean uh, the collective discernment is who do we, which Jesus do we need most now? Who's our Jesus for today? And then, and then to keep that Jesus in tension with the other. Huh? So, so we don't become like cultish. Huh? Oh, we only pay attention to Mark Jesus. Hey, he's our guy. Huh? We, we always are facing the need to balance and understand which example of Jesus at this moment in our discernment, in our thinking, in our critical judgment, this is the one that we need to follow today. Tomorrow might be the other one. Okay. Um, I see a lot of nice stuff back there, and I'm, my time's, I'm salivating for a donut. <laughs> I'm going to go get a donut so we can break for this stuff. How about we break, uh, give my voice a break too, because we've got another good time. So let's, let's take a good 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, um, if you have, uh, I'm really glad to see the chatter, that's, that's great. Uh, we've got uh, two more Gospels, and I think we're, we're pretty good on that. Um, now, uh, a few words about about Luke before we actually look at this uh, particular question. Uh, and these are kind of like uh, just three or four points to kind of put him in some context. Uh, Luke, we have discovered uh, in the course of, of uh, specialists who have paid a lot of attention to Luke, that you, you can't really consider the gospel alone. It's, it's, it's matched with Acts. Uh, and so if you read with, a, 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 so to speak, a third eye, what you'll find is that quite frequently um, uh, something Luke does in the gospel is getting you ready for a sequel follow-up in Acts. This, this happens quite a lot. It's, it's one of the uh, peculiarities of Luke. <clears throat> it's, the, it's the best, most elegant Greek in the New Testament. Uh, it's full of vocabulary that is only used by Luke. In other words, uh, you need a really good uh, Greek lexicon because he'll use words that only are used later or earlier by people like uh, uh, the philosophers and so forth. So it, it's, it, you have to really watch his writing because it's all, um, well, let me put it this way. There's, there's no detail too small that is unworthy of note. Okay, I, it, everything is carefully done. Uh, so in this particular piece, I'll be pointing out some of that. Um, Luke is, is, is uh, probably the most political of the gospel, which is to say he puts the whole thing exactly in the context of the Mediterranean Roman world consciously. So the birth of Jesus is associated with a, a Roman rule, when Caelius was the governor, that kind of thing. Uh, so, and then, of course, in Acts, um, it, it, it ends with this very strange thing uh, in which uh, uh, Paul, who is in danger of his life, uh, reminds them that as the son of a, of a wealthy merchant uh, on a river port uh, where he raised, uh, he inherited from his father Roman citizenship, which meant he had special privileges. So that's how Acts ends, uh, actually, is with him claiming the privilege of the political system, uh, legal system, and then getting uh, shipwrecked on the way to uh, being heard at the proper place, which is in Rome. So uh, it's very political in that sense. Also, there are aspects of the narrative that make it plain that Luke is aware that, that this 
that this event, or the Christ event and the emergence of the church, has happened in the context of a Roman world and deals with that as a reality, laying the ground then for eventually the need for Christianity to become not simply tolerated by the Roman world, but actually become authorized within the Roman world. And that loop is the first step uh, toward that. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, in Luke, um, Jesus is a prophet. Uh, the only gospel where he's primarily identified as a prophet. This was worked out very carefully uh, at the very beginning, you know, in which uh, his cousin was born um, uh, to a, a priestly family. And then as... Um, Jesus as an infant and child is presented um, there are prophecies uh, about him uh, directly and he clearly inherits the mantle of a prophet acts like a prophet speaks like a prophet uh, and so forth it is also the gospel of women um, which is to say we have many unique passages where women are woven into the narrative in <coughs> in ways that remind us that the other Gospels do not, that women were a part of it from the very beginning. Uh, the famous uh, example is Luke 8, 1, where it describes his mission. And it names uh, women who are become his ladies' aid society, we used to call it. Uh, names the women, some of whom are clearly patricians, uh, who are supporting him. Uh, in other words, he, he has a um, he has a, a group of women who are making his mission possible, and then of course women appear occasionally prominently uh, in Acts as well. So <coughs> uh, this is this is somewhat parallel with Paul, uh, and it's a reminder that uh, moving women to the uh, fringes later on. Uh, is contrary to the impression we get from the early church, uh, where clearly women are more uh, an important aspect from the very beginning. Mark does the same thing, but he does it in this clever uh, way of writing, <coughs> where, you remember, <coughs> as Jesus is dying on a cross, actually, um, <laughs> it's funny, uh, it describes women standing there uh, and it's the first time they've been written into the into the script at the end. But then Mark clearly says, and who had been accompanying him from Galilee. So it's what we call a, an internal unnarrated flashback <laughs> in literary terms. Which is a you've got to reread Mark and say, oh yeah, I gotta remember these three women were there. Yeah, they were there the whole time. And so like when the disciples are gathered around his feet and he says, well, no, these are my real mothers and, and sisters. Aha. Yeah, they, they, now we know the yeah, names and faces of those women. Uh, it, it's, it's much the same as what Luke does, but uh, Mark does it within this artistic way. So, um, now, the other thing I need to tell you, and this is, uh, I'm, I'm covering up my mic, I'm sorry. Uh, the other thing I need to tell you is that this is related to the Jesus Seminar, but uh, we believe, the historians who work with this, believe that the most important treasure trove of authentic Jesus parables are found in Luke. Uh, the one you have in front of you, from conservative to the most hard-nosed historian agree that the so-called uh, 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 parable of the Good Samaritan is the most reliable Jesus parable we have. Now, maybe not the literary uh, reality of it. That's Luke's creation. But the parable itself, uh, the, the essence, we would say, or the gist, even better, of the parable. You can't get any closer to being absolutely certain this is the way Jesus talked. That's pretty important stuff.
because as I say, it's not simply uh, those of us in the Jesus Seminar, but uh, even the most conservative uh, scholars. Of course, they would include a lot, of, a lot of others. So, let's look at this parable, and it's, it's remarkably short. <coughs> Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor is yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. And then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. <clears throat> Which of these three do you think was neighbor to the man who fell among the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Now, I put up here on a board uh, uh, the, the aspect of this I want to start with. Because uh, what I'm calling the nut, the actual parable within the story, has become, along with Jesus being born in a manger, the most known aspect of the New Testament by the general public. If people know anything about the New Testament, they have a, a kind of a visual understanding of Jesus being born in Bethlehem in a manger and the Good Samaritan. Uh, in fact, in many states, if not all, there is a thing called the Good Samaritan Law, right? Yeah. How many institutions are there uh, called Good Samaritan? Mm -hmm. There's even, I think, a travel trailer club called <laughs> the Good Samaritan or something like so th this is virtually a, a, a secular notion, huh? and uh, it, it has almost uh, entirely positive uh, contexts with regard to that. So there's nothing wrong with that. However, uh, <coughs> what, is, what is often made of this parable uh, it is not fully uh, what Luke is making of it. And that, that's where we are today, okay? Because we want to look at this thing as an example of the way Luke portrays Jesus. So, I'm calling this the shell or the husk and the nut. The shell or the husk is the dialogue with the, the learned scribe. And the nut is the parable itself. Now, Let's talk about the husk, because this is often, of course, what's not a part of the general appreciation of this parable. Well, with regard to the husk, uh, Luke salts it with some language uh, that, is, that is significant. It, it begins with the wish for eternal life. And the word is used for a Inheritance. I mean, it's a very, it's a, it's a typical Pauline word, in, in a matter of fact. But the phrase is actually te ponesas. The word 
Honiro means to make. How can, I, how can I create for myself? The next word is zone, like zoology, life. And then comes the adjective eternal. How can I make life eternal for myself? It, it, it's clearly a, a self-interested question. The second way Luke sets up the, 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 the scribe, the lawyer, uh, is to say is, is to do a rare internal omniscient narrator thing. And, and he goes on to ask specificity about who the neighbor is uh, in order to justify himself. That, that's just exactly the word that Paul uses in Romans, how we justify it. So he's, self, he's trying to build for himself a, a, a life after death. And then in the rabbinical discussion, to make sure he's OK. Now, <coughs> this, is, this is accurate with regard to the rabbinic tradition. And I want to talk a little bit about that, because this, this is something that is uh, uh, important to understanding what Luke is doing. Uh, many, many Christians assume that this, these excruciating rabbinical dialogues are about trying to uh, earn righteousness by doing. But uh, the Jewish scholars I respect most, particularly Herschel, points out that it's in, it's in the, the agonizing over the details of Torah or law that we are ourselves uh, made holy. Not in what we do with that, but, but honoring that law enough to agonize with it, rabbinically. Huh? You see the point? It's a difference. So for instance, if you just looked at Mishnah, I used to give my students uh, Mishnah copies, the first kind of compilation of the rabbis. You'll see these agonizing discussions. Like, okay, we're, 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 we're only, uh, we're not to pick all of the grapes so that there's something for the poor to reclaim for themselves. But what Burpree said, it said, all it says is defective clusters. <coughs> and one rabbi said, oh, a defective cluster is one lacking a shoulder, but having a pendant and one shoulder. Other rabbi said, no, no, no. A defective cluster is a pendant lacking both shoulders. <laughs> and we, we laugh at that, but you see, when you devote your life to it means you, you're taking it seriously. You're really taking it seriously. And this goes on and on and on. Now, what I always point out to my, my seminary students is, uh, okay, re read this back. Okay, uh, what, what's the answer? What, what's the right answer? Oh, gosh, there, there is none. Yeah. It's not the search for the right answer. It's honoring the inheritance of the Torah so much that you keep searching for what's right for you. Uh, that's a remarkable insight. So we know that this, what do we know? We know that this, uh, Describe this lawyer, and by the way, what, what lawyer means, it would be lawyer in the same sense that my Catholic students, my, 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 my uh, priestly students, were lawyers. They, they were becoming lawyers. It, it, means, it means close, authoritative study and judgment concerning the law. That, that's what that's about. He is a corrupt scholar because he's limiting his understanding to his own self-interest come contrary to the very spirit of rabbinical inquiry. This, is, this prepares us for the tragic thing that happens in Acts, which is that tragically, rather than seeing Jesus as the final prophet with the fullness of revelation, 
the rabbis and others reject. And that's tragic. Because it is in their own best interest to recognize him as the final prophet. But they'd rather, they're enmeshed in their own and cultured interest. So this order prepares us for what's going to happen next. That's, that's, that's an interesting thing. So that, that's, that's, the, that's the husk. And that, that's important because it's the problem that, that Luke is struggling with. And let me put that in even broader context. Uh, much of the world's problems from ancient times until today are about the fact that all of the children of Abraham hate each other. Much of the problems. Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. Look at the history of hate, conflict, wars, genocide between them. Huh? So Luke, Luke is talking about the fact that it's a great tragedy that Jesus the prophet was not able in his mission given to his disciples and apostles to complete the circle of joining together all of the children of Abraham and Sarah. And the preaching is long. The problem is that Ishmael is not included. So there's tragedy. So Luke understands that there's tragedy that has to be reported. And, and this kind of plans to see. What's the answer? The Good Samaritan story is the answer. That's the answer. That's the answer. And so the question becomes, and Luke, how wide is God's mercy? That's the question. The parable answers the question. And the answer is without boundary. Uh, if, if as a movement, uh, Christianity had been capable of living the parable, uh, history would have turned out far differently. There are, there is no boundary, none. Now let's look at the parable itself. Uh, it begins uh, first uh, in, in terms of the Greek text. Uh, with uh, verse 30. And the first word in Greek, I'm going to have you look at this because this is, this is something, this is the kind of thing that, that Luke does that so makes him so incredible. Um, if you it, count down in the Greek text, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Now count in four words, and you see a T and an I and a funny looking S, you see that? That is the word who, so the phrase is, who is my neighbor? That's the question being asked of the scribe. Now keep going on the same line and count from the end of it back three words, and you see another T. Mm -hmm. So you see how beautiful this is? He's, the, the lawyer says, who, and then Jesus answered, a man who. So he's, he's answering the question. I'm, I'm going to show you who is, who is the neighbor. And interestingly enough, it's the man in the ditch. It's the man in the ditch. Because it, the first word is, by the way, if you're looking at that line, anthropos, A, something looks like a B, and then a, uh, a, an O with a line through it. That's the word anthropos, like anthropology. A man who was going up. Now on that same line, don't don't lose it. Now go to the to the 30 on that line. And the next word looks like a U and like a pi for in mathematics and an O. Okay, now that word, there's there's Luke showing off 
his erudition. That word is translated, uh, but it, it, it not not as such. Um, it, it says replied, okay, but this is a word no used nowhere else. It's used um, throughout ancient Greek literature, classical literature, and it means something like this. The hoopo means taking up. It means taking up this. In other words, what what, what he's saying is not just replied. He's he's actually taking up the question, even though it's badly motivated. He's going to take it up. He accepts it. That's very interesting. He doesn't reject it. He accepts it. He takes it up. And the Greek stuff uh, in in the room will recognize uh, that, that that word is when you look at it, you'll find that's very, very rarely used. Okay. So now here's what happens. We have uh, Luke showing off again his style with a series of what we call aorist verbs, and the verbs are uh, uh, repeated uh, twice, and then pattern is broken. Look at the English translation. Fell among hands of robbers, fell, stripped, beat, went away, leaving. Five verbs, and th these are what we call aorist verbs. These are not long-lasting verbs. These are these are point of actions, quick. Fell among, stripped, beat, went away, leaving. It's like bang, 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 it's like that, like like a machine gun of verbs. Huh? The half dead word, rare, rare, rare. Again, Luke showing off. It occurs occasionally in Greek literature, and it literally means half dead. And I'll tell you why. Here, here, I like little stuff like this. Maybe you don't. Uh, <coughs> count down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine lines down. Second word. Uh, uh, pardon me. I'm, I'm sorry. Eight words. Eight lines down. We find the 31. The word to the left of the number 31. You see it? Hami mm thane. -hmm. Now. You, if you're a pickup uh, aficionado, what's a hemi head? That's where we get the word. Big engine. Hemi. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. This, this is the word hemi. He's hemi dead. Yeah. The, 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 again, this, this only occurs rarely. I mean, this is just Luke showing off his <laughs> vocabulary. But, but you get the picture. I mean, because it's a very dramatic word. I'm hemi dead. He's hemi dead. Then, um, another rare word uh, with regard to the priest. And this is interesting. Find the 31 in the Greek text. The next word looks like a K and an A and a T and an A. Well, the <coughs> one after that is souk kurion. Again, hardly ever used anywhere. And here's what it means. It means by chance. Mm -hmm. By we, we would actually actually say uh, according to chance. Huh? And actually the, the proper meaning of fortuitously. Huh? Just by chance. Just by chance. A priest yeah, by chance. And now here we get another series of verbs. Saw went to the air side. Second case, Levite, saw went to the air side. Exact same phrasing. Like he's moving you along quickly. Now comes a Samaritan. And now we have the verbs. And I have actually counted them in the Greek text. Starting with that A you see where the 32 is. And here now we have a matching set of not five verbs concerning the robbers, but eight. And what this does is, uh, the, with each verb, your fascination with the Samaritan grows. He binds, the Samaritan is bound to you in affection and admiration with each verb. And this is very rare. Eight aorist verbs. Bang, 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 bang. So as you can have no doubt 
as to what's happening. Came near him, saw him, moved with pity, went to him, bandaged, poured, put him on his animal, brought him to an inn, took care of him, took out two denarii, gave them, take care. Bing, 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 bing. It's like building a legal case <coughs> for the lawyer in the husk it's, it's, a rabbinical, it's a rabbinical answer. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll define for you who, who the neighbor is and who acts like a neighbor. you got two neighbors. Because the answer is, the teeth to someone is the guy in the ditch. But they, then is a turn because the one who acts like a neighbor to the neighbor in the ditch. So the Samaritan sees the guy in the ditch as a neighbor and the guy in the ditch now recognizes that the Samaritan acts like a neighbor. You see? These are neighbors together across barriers. Now, here is the creme de la creme Lucan fascination with detail. If you look on the one, two, three, four, fifth line down in Greek, the 29. Okay, you see the one to justify myself. You see that, okay? <coughs> and then I want you to go down from there. Just give me a minute. <coughs> yep, uh, it took me a minute. I've got it here. If you look, can you find the B in the Greek text with a 33 beside it? Okay, then the next word is the word Greek word for Samaritan. Now we get another teach. Do you get the idea? Who. So now we got three who's. Okay. Then the word that's in bold print. Now that's an O and a D and an E and a U and a long O and an N that looks like a V. Hoduon. Hoduon. Now, just follow me here. I, I promise I'm not here to give you a Greek lesson. But I, want, I, want, I, want, I can't do this unless I take you a little bit deeper. Okay. So here's the word. I'll do it in English. This word never occurs anywhere else, anywhere. Classical literature, New Testament, nowhere. It's built on the noun, hodas, which means road. Now go back up to the English. And in bold print, right about in the middle, you see the words, while traveling, and that word, that's how it gets translated. Now, I want you to go down to point three underneath. The artfulness of Luke is seen especially in the odd word, hoduon. It is impossible to translate so as to convey the subtle nuance Luke plants. In his second volume, Acts of the Apostles, the word hodos, is used to describe the path taken by those who choose to follow the preaching of the good news. And I cite all the places where that's the case. It can be no accident that Luke here uses a crafted word found no place else to describe the Samaritan. It might be translated, the person following the way, capital W, Luke appears to present the Samaritan as already a, the follower of the way, even though the good news has not yet been preached to the Samaritans, but will be in Acts 8.35. One of the references using the way as the term for the believer's path to salvation. So in all of those Acts passages, now watch this, in all of the Acts passages, what's happening is that instead of describing it as the church, it's described as the way, the way, the holders, the way followers of the way. So the Samaritan, they use a word to describe what he's doing, doing an action word, in a strange participle created on the noun way. All you can say is, 
he, he's weighing. He's weighing. <laughs> he, he, he's a weighing guy. So even before there is a way, the Samaritan is acting in such a way that makes him a follower of the way. You get it? Yes. It's incredible. What's, what, what, why is Luke doing this? He's doing two things at once. He's saying, how wide is God's mercy, and thus how wide is our consideration of who is a neighbor? It is has no limits. Doesn't matter whether the great flesher has a pendant or lacking or two lacking or a, a shoulder black. It doesn't matter. Everybody is your neighbor. And we're going to go out and we're going to announce that after the resurrection and the Pentecost, and we're going to bring in people who are going to call followers of the way. This Samaritan is the prophet of the way. It's incredible. Knowing that, it's outrageous. Because it turns everything rabbinical on its head. You don't even have to have the discussion anymore. Don't discuss it. You don't need to discuss it. So, let me go back to Acts. Now in Matthew, these guys listening to this would get it. These guys don't think. Oh, hi. These guys do not get it. Okay? Now, here's what happens in Acts. And I kind of owe this to my colleague, uh, Bob Tannehill, who's written a two-volume narrative study of, of Luke Acts. He and I have had discussions about this. He, he doesn't... This is not exactly his point, but he helped me begin thinking this way. What, what we don't have in Acts is after Pentecost, the, the, the 12, including the ones now newly elected by a short straw, sit around and say, now, how should we carry out this mission? They don't do that. They're, they're, there's no decision making. They just, they stand up and they preach. They get thrown in jail. Their deacons get stoned. Some people listen, some don't. And all of a sudden then, one of them is instructed by the Holy Spirit, I want you to go and preach to the Samaritans. Oh, well, <laughs> I, we, we, thought this was a, we thought this was a renewal of Judaism. They're not Jews. No, go. They go. They're a convert. Then there's this black Ethiopian eunuch lacking testicles, who's completely out of bounds. And then the Holy Spirit says to him, go, go preach to him. He's reading Isaiah. He goes and preaches to him. Instantly converted. Demands baptism. Peter's on the rooftop. You see where this is going? It's, it's, I describe this as, you know, the B8 as <laughs> it's a series of dope slaps. Samaritan? <laughs> black, black, black people lacking testicles? <laughs> Peter's on the housetop, right? Kill and eat these animals. They're unclean. Knock on the door. I'm a God-fearer. I command a legion. I have people gathered. Come and preach to them. Yeah, I guess I'd better. <laughs> preach to some different degree. You mean Gentiles? <laughs> you see where we're going with this? Then, then, of course, we have interleaved with that 10 chapter, 11 chapter follow, chapter 9. Paul being knocked, as one of my colleagues said, on his ass, off his ass. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. <laughs> you got it. You see where this is going? So the Samaritan anticipates a series of dope slap revelations that leave them astounded that everyone is a neighbor that there is no boundaries to God's mercy. And Peter, said, Peter, Peter stands up in chapter 10, verse 34, and here's what he says. I perceive that God is no, is no prohibitor 
it, it, it was without prejudice. And now I get it. God's not with has no prejudice. So then finally, when the the council meets at eleven, and Peter talks him into accepting Gentiles, and then Paul gets coming. Now, now we we have it. Now, now they finally get it. Now they finally get it. If they had been listening carefully <laughs> and really got the Samaritan story, they wouldn't have needed all the dope slaps. Huh? <laughs> but Paul, but see, that's important. Is Paul, Paul absolutely understands. See, this is not an accident. Paul, uh, or should I say, Luke absolutely understands that, that the wideness of God's mercy is so astounding. You can't expect human beings to get it right away. You're, you're enmeshed in your own thing, your own identity. You, you probably know this, but in many Native American groups, you know, the, 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 the Navajo call themselves the, the, the Nami, right? Okay. Do you, do you know why? It means the people. Many Native, their name for themselves are pe the people, the people. Huh? It's, it's in all of us. There's boundaries. That's how we identify. That's how we know who we are. It's the boundaries. Huh? So, yeah, it's going to be pretty hard to accept a story about these neighbors that discover each other and are, are help each other, and they do it without boundaries. That's, that's unheard of in the world. I'm going to finish that sentence. Then and now. So why do we need Luke? <laughs> why do we need Luke's Jesus? Break the boundaries. Yeah. Don't recognize them. Act as if they're not there. Cross them. Destroy them. Mitigate them. You know, it's, a, it's a series of verbs. Final thing. The verb used to describe... You see, the first two who under, understand boundaries see and pass by. The, the pattern is broken but maintained because the traveler, who is a Samaritan, sees... And what? Well, let me, let me take you down to point... Um, I don't think I have it in the points, but let me point something out to you. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the word because it's too important. That line you had, B33, where I pointed out hoduon, if you keep going along, you find some other bold print, and then you find two small words, and then the next one, which is almost unpronounceable, that is a word used with almost total rarity. Oh, I do have the point. It's number two. It's only used twice otherwise. It's the widow of Nain and the prodigal son's father. And that, that, that last one is probably the, uh, the key one. Okay. He, this is saying the Samaritan acts like Jesus and like the father of the errant son who were trained. Remember, remember the story, of, uh, that's Luke's parable, by the way, right? The, 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 of the, the errant son and the elder son. Mm -hmm. Remember when the father sees him yeah. and describes them, him as running mm -hmm. uh, and throwing himself behind the son's neck? And the word that describes internally what's happening is this word. It means it, it's also a visceral word. It's, it's not a rational response. It's a visceral response of compassion. So this, this, is, this is how the Samaritan acts. He doesn't see and pass by. He responds with passion. And it's compassion. And that compassion moves him to do what? To, 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 to break the boundaries. So back, back, back to how we're using the various Jesus that we have. Uh, where and when do we need the Luke and Jesus, whose mission finally gets sorted out with difficulty and having to shake the apostles by the shoulders until their teeth rattle? 
Where do we need him? It's a, I, I, we don't know. I, I, it, but it happens all the time. I would have to say that in our contemporary national situation uh, right now, boy, I wish we had some authoritative voices speaking from the heart of Luke's Jesus mm -hmm. about boundaries. Mm -hmm. Whatever we're not in the room, regardless of where you stand, we do not agree that our division is mm -hmm. killing us. Huh? Mm -hmm. I, I, just one important detail. I, I sort of assumed it, but the man it was probably a Jew. So there was, it was the Samaritan. Well, we, see, see Jew. that that's the brilliance of it. We that's don't the, know. Right, that's it, but, it's a certain but man. It doesn't matter, but yeah. it, it probably could have been. But it's just the point. He didn't care. Well, what you'll find in commentaries is yeah. useless discussion of oh, what could have been the reason for the priest now? Is there a good Jew? Yeah. Or the, well, you know that, that the point when when Luke uses the word tis someone or one. Three times, he's telling you, this is a generalist issue. This is about yeah. humankind. Right. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who's in the doesn't day. matter. Yeah. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Could even be a Samaritan in the day. Well, yeah. But but it doesn't matter. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Yeah. yeah. And it doesn't matter, but it also they had their excuses. They did, of course. If, if, they, oh. if they had handled oh, this. Oh yes. This a damaged person oh. uh, who may even be, if he's half dead, he may die on their hand. Uh, then they're unclean for seven days and they can't th th That's the days. stuff you find coming. It's exactly right. Everybody, no. Uh, well, in fact, uh, Peter objects. He's got his excuses. Yeah, well, it's unclean. If he kills those unclean animals, he can't. Well, the, all that does is make the story more realistic because we all have our excuses for limiting the boundaries of God's mercy. We all have our excuses. And Luke is saying the only reason finally we are at the place where we're turning the world upside down is because we have no boundaries. And when we do have no boundaries, the world seeks a place at our table. Yeah, there you go. John. I don't want to cheat, John. <laughs> and I need to do a little board work here. I've got two texts here, and uh, I'm going to say a couple of general things about John, too. Okay. John does not use really any technical language. He uses just the remarkable thing about John's Greek is it's, just, it's, it's easy, it's straightforward. And he doesn't use a lot of fancy words like Luke does. What he does is he uses common words that then are freighted with meaning. So you have to bring meaning to the word. The word doesn't explain itself because it's a common word. Okay, that, that, that's the kind of thing that, that's going on. Another thing about John, uh, and just uh, I want to put it in perspective. John, of the four Gospels, is the Gospel has been paid most attention to by two classes of the best minds of Christianity. One, intellectuals and philosophers. Two, mystics. This is the Gospel of mystics. Probably the most brilliant piece of writing in Christendom we've ever seen is now lost mostly. It's ten folio volumes interpreting John's Gospel by the Alexandrian scholar Origen. Brilliant because it exceeded, it, it, it was fully in touch with both Aristotelian and Platonic philosophy. Did not use either, but wrote in such a way that he was philosophically satisfying to those who knew those philosophers. Remarkable. Why? Because his gospel is entirely in a cosmic setting. His gospel is cosmic. Okay. 
and uses cosmic language. So, as many scholars will point out, uh, the ethical aspects even of John have a cosmic viewpoint. For instance, sin in John's Gospel is never transgression against laws as such. It's sin is darkness. Sin is rejection of enlightenment. Uh, fascinating, utterly fascinating. So, I need to do a little, a little pre. I got time to do this, okay? Because this is cosmic. I want, I want to describe for you the um, the ontological or, or the, the the cosmic worldview that that we set this gospel, on. and and it's it's it's. I'm dependent here on a, a wonderful Jewish scholar, uh, Martha Himmelfarb, uh, who has better than any, I think, described this. Uh, also, Charles Worth, uh, not quite as good. Uh, but I'm, uh, this is not my own stuff. Um, obviously, this is just common understanding of that kind of a world. And, and, and it's this. And you must think of this as almost like the night sky. But in this understanding of this world, um, there is, there is a, a divide between what you could call the, the known, uh, and this would be the empirical world, what you can see, touch, feel, experience. That this, this is the this is the plane we live on, and then this is this is the world of the unknown. And the other thing we could say is that this world, uh, as we would say in German, is the Spiegelhefte. This this world is the mirror of the one we can't see. And so the reality is not what we can see and touch here, but this world. This is reality. And in the Jewish uh, context, Christian context, Jewish Christian, this is God. This, this, is, this is the realm of God. This, this barrier here I've drawn to be a barrier that can't be passed is, <coughs> as Martha Himmelfarb refers to it, a semi-permeable barrier, so that occasionally the the real world of reality penetrates into this world. Now, the most common way this happens in our general understanding is is what angels. So occasionally, information or guidance from this realm comes by way of these these visitors. Occasionally. There is penetration this way. Example would be Enoch, huh? or, 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 John, or, or John's revelation. I was taken up, huh? allowed to visit this other world of reality. Why, why, why would these two directions of transfer happen? Because this plane cannot ever achieve anything like fullness, enlightenment, or safety and salvation without the aid of this realm. Does that include like a near-death experience? Exactly. Yeah. Well, and by the way, this is, this is the, the, the plot for countless pieces of literature and movies. A Christmas Carol is a secular apocalypse. Spirit passed. Your present, he's transported to what benefit to his salvation, Scrooge, as an unhappy, nasty person. He's redeemed by this visitation from otherworldly beings who transport him across time and space. And that's what happens to people like John, uh, the seer, and uh, I could go into it. There's a book of Enoch that's like that that explains all of this. Okay. Enoch is taken up. And he's shown the zodiac, for instance. He's shown how it was that sin was created in the world. Who was it that taught women to wear makeup? It was bad angels who fell in love with them. You think I'm joking? No, 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 no. He's, he's yeah. This is yeah. Bad angels uh, seduced uh, uh, earthly women and taught them to wear coal and oh yeah yeah. And then taught them to make weapons of war. That's how we, I mean, 
so it, this is this is common stuff. Huh? And the way to visualize this is um, the night sky with little e earth glow, where you, you you sit in your back and you see these pinholes, huh? Mm -hmm. You can see why they came up with it. There's something. See, these are just little pieces of light coming down. So. If you want the real goods, if you want something you can depend upon cosmically, eternally, that moves out beyond these limited boundaries that we, you know, you know, this I should here's what I should do here. I'm sorry. I should I should have done this. Infinity of both ends, no beginning, no end. Ours has a beginning and an end. If you want something that goes beyond this into this realm, it's got to come from here. Now, go to your text. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Okay, where's it coming from? Where's, where's the Word coming from? <laughs> That's why it's not... Uh, and a man named Joseph was betrothed of a woman named Mary. That ain't, no, that's not the start. Yeah. That's, not, that's not the start you, you want. If you want something that is eternal, unending, divine, you start with the source of the incarnation, the word, in heaven with God. And look at the next line. In the beginning... From infinity, huh? you see the point? Now, I'm not going to read this, but I, I've highlighted, go to the bottom, you see, let's count light. One, two, three, four, verb enlightens, okay. Five times, light, 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 light. That's who Jesus is. He's light. And he comes into darkness. Darkness is not evil. It's darkness because it's, mis it's lack of understanding, lack of enlightenment. And the darkness will tell itself its wisdom, that it is light. So when true light tries to penetrate false light or darkness, darkness will resist it. It has to. Because if I, if I say, well, wait a minute, that's not light, I've got light. That, that's not light, that's, that's false light. It's fake light. <laughs> Did I do that? <laughs> that's the whole thing of John. So it's all about source. Let, let, let me illustrate this. The, the, one of the stories that is a favorite from John is the, uh, the water turned wine. And the key of the whole story is that when the wine is presented, uh, the, 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 the steward of the feast, the, the MC, makes the mistake of not asking where it was from. And then at the very end, when Pilate, in these multiple interviews with John, who I think becomes a convert, actually, a, a hack, a cowardice convert. He says, finally, it's, he's really scary. He said, where are you from? He's got the right question. Because if you know where he's from, then you know you've got true light confronting you. So it's source. Source is the issue. It's always source. Now the other thing is, and this is a point I really want to make before our time's up. Look at the very bottom of the page. <coughs> you see the word believe? Mm -hmm. Okay, in John's Gospel, 60 plus times, the word faith, zero. Word doesn't occur. It's contrary to Johannian understanding. Now you should be asking why. I'll tell you why. 
And here's another reason why Billy Graham was wrong and the others. The way the way born again Christianity is presented is all you have to do is to have enough faith to pray the, pray the sinner's prayer. The faith is a tool for achieving the grace that God gives. Okay? That's why John doesn't use the word faith. Because nothing pertaining to life can be the result of human endeavor. Ever. So it's always a verb. It's action. Now let's look at the dialogue with Nicodemus. This, this is this. I want to. I want to get. I want to get through this. John three one. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. And Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Hey, wait a minute, I thought that's born again. No, it's not. It's mistranslated. Well, would John say as a Baptist, or John the Baptist, he'd say you're born again at your baptism. Yeah, but 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 th there's no born again here. This is this is now you are re there is regeneration, but you're born from above. That word anothen has been translated again, but it is a word that also means from above. Now, if you read the whole story, it makes more cohesive sense to translate it from above. Why? Because it's not simply born again. It's the source of being reborn. And that source is from above. In other words, so that salvation everyone seeks for regeneration of all that is wrong about humanness, that regeneration is, is only a gift of God, only an act of God. And grasping that is not a matter of faith. It's a matter of acting on the enlightenment. You mean to tell me that this born again Christianity thing is completely a misinterpretation of John's gospel? Yes. It's a dumbed down understanding and an inaccurate understanding because it substitutes human effort in seeking to be reborn by the prayer of the sinner. In no place in John are you reborn by offering a prayer or asking forgiveness. There's, there, it, it doesn't occur. In John's Gospel, you experience regeneration by a divine enlightenment and gift. That's all of God's doing. All of God's doing. Pretty remarkable. And it's it's an important it's an important understanding of Jesus because somewhat in congruity with Matthew, the Jesus of John is saying that seeking enlightenment is the essence of salvation, not claiming something that you grasped by your effort of faith. You see the difference? This is why this is why the philosophers love this gospel because because it, it, it presents categories that can be then given handles in philosophical understandings of what it means to be truly human as humans were created to be rather than what to become by flawed enculturation. Did I get that sentence up? Oh, wow. <laughs> that's it. That's that's it. It's something else. It's something other. It's the seeking of enlightenment. Therefore, the mystics are right. There's always a place in the life of John's Jesus and his encouragement to seek enlightenment and understanding that comes from the divine source. And what is that source? How is that to be found? What, what are the handles for that? 
pretty plain in John's Gospel from the very beginning. It's dwelling together in love. It's, it's communing together and seeking to find in our love divine love. And in that divine love, understanding the fullness of enlightenment that God is bringing to us. So you can't do it alone. That's the other mistake of the Billy Graham Crusades. As much as I like the guy in many ways, huh? <laughs> but th it, there's the mistake. You, you, you get out of that seat and march down here. Huh? Th th this is an individualized understanding of salvation. And in John's Gospel, it's a communal community of love that is seeking understanding because that love is the love implanted by divine revelation. That's, that we need, so because, sure, we need to be out in the street feeding people and clothing people. We need, as a community, to be following the enlightened path of Johanni Jesus by coming together and agreeing that divine love is the source of all love and seeking to perfect that love in our midst. That, that's what he says at the end of the gospel. Yeah, what do I leave with you? Love. So thank God for John's gospel. Uh, my, my, my anger here is how it, you see, here's, what, here's, what, here's, here's why we lost the 10 folio volumes, okay. Unfortunately, our uh, origin came to the point of saying, you can understand and get salvation on this common level, just read John as if it's a mark and you're fine. But he said, if you want a higher understanding, and so he implied, and in fact said, that there are two levels of Christians, the truly enlightened and those who just get salvation. That elitism uh, is, is to be not desired, okay? But the point is that if you read John on the surface, it's easy to entirely read into John Pauline Romans material. <laughs> And in that case, what's happening is you're not allowing the Jesus of John to really benefit you in, in the way that, that needs to be benefited. So how can I, how can I put any more handles on this? And uh, there, there, there are ways, OK. Uh, remember, you, we, count, we count the number of times the verb is used. Uh, there's, there's the clue. There's the clue. Uh, the, a matter of enlightenment is a matter of action. You, you, can't, you can't just be enlightened by learning. You, you are enlightened by actively engaging in that, in that in enterprise called believing, activating believing. That means there are, there, there are feet and arms and legs and lips and hearing to be applied to the process of accessing this divine understanding. And that means, and that's why the mystics picked it up. So if you were to look at hymnody, if you were to look at the writings of mystics, if you were to look at those looking at the life of prayer, the value of meditation, it would all be based on John's Gospel. All be based on John's Gospel. What does that mean? It means that when we invest in the worship of Music that, that speaks a language not spoken to us inwardly, that's Johannian Christianity. When we gather together and share each other's burdens and joys and seek to understand the true nat nature of, of the presence of God in each of us, that's Johannian Christianity. When we say, wait a minute, instead of just doing something knee jerk here and acting, let's Let's go into a dark room, light a candle, think about our lives, and then afterwards go and have coffee and say, what do you think it is that we're being called to do in love? That's Johannian Christian. Do I make any sense here? Yeah. It's hard to get handles. <clears throat> okay, I got two minutes. So what I'm pleading for is, informed thinking, critically judging congregants and pastors, 
who say this is not dead literature. The Jesus of the four Gospels has guidance for us. We must look carefully, allow each of those portraits to be on their own, ask them to speak to each other, ask them to act as an umbrella as we sit under that umbrella and deal with those difficult decisions we're having to make, those judgments, those allocations of resources, time, treasure. Help us, help us to see what would this Jesus do, what are we for, and look at it. And then say, we know where we're going and we know whose way we're following. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.